Yeah, okay. Okay, nice to have you here. Nice to someone to listen to us. Uh, I will present the project called Frequency Services from Wind Power in the Swedish Power System. My name is Ola Karlsson. This work has been done together with Matthias Persson from RISE and Sarah Fogelström from Chalmers. Uh, the other partners in the project, uh, the partners in the project are RISE, Chalmers with the division of dynamics and Chalmers with the division of electric power engineering. And the industry partners are Stena Renewable, Rabban Sede Kraft, Centrica, SVK and Energiforsk. So that's the group that had to work together for the coming two years as the project is still running. First, very, very basic about frequency control. The frequency control is necessary to keep the frequency in the power grid stable. So there has to be a balance between consumption and production in the system. So if there will be more consumption, then the frequency will go down less uh, consumption the uh, com compared with production, the frequency go up. And that has to be done the whole time, every millisecond, every second we are adjusting the frequency. Uh, responsible for the frequency tracking is the TSO of Sweden, Sensekraftnet. Okay, and we go down to the basic of frequency controlled by wind turbines. It's just to control the output power from the wind turbine, then we influence the frequency in the grid. Sure, one wind turbine will not do the work, but many ones together will do good work. Uh, but the frequency controlled by wind turbines, then the power will not be in an optimal energy way, it will just be a controlled way. And hopefully there will be a market that pays for the energy losses if we not do it in an optimal energy way, like that. Okay, that's the basic. We should control the power output from the wind turbine. That's the basic stuff. A theory, the project will uh, consist of a theory study. We will make modelings. We will make, we will learn about how people do in other countries and see the limitation of frequency control also. And the, the, what I would do will be the cover in the survey. So there will be test operation also on frequency control, both by Chalmers wind turbine, it's just directed on the island of Björke, and commercial wind turbines, maybe on Gotland or other places in, in Sweden. So here is some basic knowledge about frequency. What you see up here is the uh, frequency during gener generation loss. Probably is the winter time and the nuclear power station is closing down too quick uh, as an emergency stop. We lose, lose roughly 1000 megawatt and the frequency start to drop. And then uh, the hydropower station in Sweden realized, oh, whoops, something problem is going on. And they open the valves as much as they can and provide extra power. So after another five to six, seven seconds, we get an extra 1000 megawatt from the hydropower station and we get a stable point in the grid again. And then we add some extra power into the grid and we climb back to more close to 50 hertz and yeah, the problem is solved. That's the way it works. It can also be, as we see in the other slide on the right, that the frequency can jump up and that's happened mostly due to export suddenly stop. We export quite a lot of power to Poland, Latvia and uh, Germany, Denmark also, uh, by HVDC cables. And if someone closes down very quick, that's 700 megawatt, then we get this type of frequency jump instead. And we have to take down the production in another way here. And if we, as Rice and Matthias has done, uh, the, he has investigate what's happened during two years of the frequency in the power system of Sweden. And all, every dot here is a frequency dip. And then how deep, deep it is, you see here, down to 49.4 Hertz, that, that's, that's very deep, it should not go there. Or, and then how quick it goes down here also. 
I calculated this one was quite nice. It was 0 0.0.4, so it was up here somewhere. It can be much steeper. Uh, so what we see here, we have some deep one during summer period because then it's not so much other production there. Uh, that is 1,000 lost compared with 10,000 as a production. In winter time, we have roughly 20,000 megawatt in production and uh, the 1,000 is not so heavy anymore. Okay, <clears throat> there are different services that are you can precipitate in to keep up the market. Uh, today, hydropower is doing this work to 99.9%. There are some wind turbines, but very, very, very few. So if there is a problem in the frequency go down, then first is this frequency containment reserve coming in for normal operation. And if there's a disturbance, we have frequency containment reserve for disturbance. That has to act a little bit quicker during before 30 seconds. The other one have three minutes to stack them. And uh, when this first one is coming, uh, are not working anymore, automatic re frequency restoration reserve is coming. And after that, the manual is coming to really keep it stable for a long time. And we also have this new one just starting this year, fast frequency reserve that comes in extremely quick when the frequency goes below a certain value and then stay for maybe just 10 to 15 seconds and then go down again. This is the services we have today. The question is, are these good for wind turbines or not? Should there be other services coming that serves wind turbines better? That's maybe, maybe we can answer that when the project is ended within two years. Okay, something about wind power. Hopefully you all know the, how the power of the wind turbine is calculated by this formula by a half and the density of the air, the swept area of the wind turbine, the CP value, the efficiency of the blades and gearbox and so on. And the efficiency of the blades are depending on the tip speed ratio. That's the tip speed divided by wind speed and the pitch angel here and the cube of the wind. This 3D plot, you have CP value here, how good it is. It's never more than theoretically it's up here, 0.959, but normally it's 0.45 or something like that. Okay, and then we have tip speed ratio and pitch angel. And you see that tip speed ratio is typical five, six, seven, something like that. And if you change the pitch angel, you climb the curve like that. If you change the speed of the turbine according to the wind, you can climb up and down like this. And then we got the operation of the whole wind turbine like this. So you have the power of the wind turbine the speed of the wind turbine is there. And uh, oops, what's happening? There we are. And here we can see how the different services fit in wind turbine operation. If the wind is not so high, we are here. And then we spill some wind because we go down in power. And then we're ready to give more power to the system when, that's, when they ask for that. Or if we are going for full power, it's always easy to pitch a little bit and go down in power also. This one is coming very soon, these services is not there today. Or if you go by full speed of the rotation speed of the turbine, but not full power, then you're really able to do this fast frequency uh, response, reserve and help the system in, in a quick way during 10 seconds, something like that. If we go to this, we can understand how we can work with this. We have this typical power wind curve of the wind turbine like this. And if you curtail, take down the power in a different way, you are ready to help the system in a better way. So for example, if you curtail from this point down to this point, 
you're ready to speed up or regulating up the power. And then you have to be in operation in this value is the best to do of the wind. So between six, seven meters per second to 12 meters per second. During a time of normally 10, 20, 30, 40% of the year, we're operating in this area. So it's a large part of the year we're operating in this area and can be ready to serve with this service if we spin some wind. Or if you go up here, work with full speed and not full power. And then we can serve this for maybe 20% of the year of the time. This wind turbine is, is the best to serve for these services. Or if you go by full power, it's easy, always is to go down. Sure, you can go down when you have less power also, but then you're not so powerful in your actions. So the market has to develop. The, the way that the wind turbine operators operate the wind turbines has to be developed. So this match in an optimal way. So the trick is there are many options, which is the best one and how to make money of it. That's the question. We'll just do a little bit deeper in the, uh, in the fast frequency reserve. ENSO is the uh, body of uh, different, uh, many TSO in the European countries. They have this recommendation that you should run here, then go up and give some extra power for maybe five, 10 seconds, and then go down, have a stable value, and then recovery part also. That we can read in nice reports that have been published quite recently. And then we go to what is, can be offered by the wind turbine manufacturers if you look in their brochures. Sure, they can change this if they like. For example, Enercon, they like to have this boost, ramp up, have this boost for a while, and then go down immediately and make a recovery. It doesn't fit the mid exactly, you see here between the N3. That have to be stable value here also, but that can be adjusted. General Electric have it other way. I think it's a little bit smoother for the wind turbine, like this instead, up and down more smoothly. So sure, these actions will recover extra torque in the drivetrain. It will recover pitch control in different ways, and that will be wear and tear of the wind turbines. So there are some costs during this frequency actions. There's an example from Fran, uh, from Texas. You can see the frequency is the, this red one. And here we have a wind turbine that are curtailed a little bit. But all these wind turbines together have uh, 43 uh, megawatt in power production. And then there's a frequency dip due to some power loss somewhere. And then we see how the wind turbine can produce more power, be there. And after a while, when other power sources come up, we can go down to normal value again. So this is how nice and easy wind turbine can help the power system. Do we make some money? This is the prices for different services in the Nordic spot market on the 4th of January. Uh, Ola, you need, you need to conclude now. Okay, that was not so nice, but I will try. Uh, as you see, if you go by this frequency service, a normal place, and you make ma most money of it. And spot price is not so good. What more? I will just say that we will do simulations and what I said, test on models of different wind turbines. And can just also say that we have Chalmers wind turbine up and soon operation. We have models of the wind turbine up and operation and we can see how the simulation is working. And we can have a stable power and thereby the pitch control is there and do the work. If we decrease the power, the pitch will work more. That's the dilemma. And in ashes that the program is called, we can get out different values. For example, what is the forces in the drivetrain? 
or just the force of a pitch bearings. And then we can take that to more detailed models and make more lifetime, more better lifetime estimations of what pitch control or frequency control means. Uh, yeah, we will start to test the Chalmers during yeah, the winter period. We will hopefully do the practical test during the spring period. And uh, yeah, and we will evaluate the practice, uh, evaluate the practice tests. Chalmers and Rice will do that work together. That was the end of my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ola. If you have any questions, uh, please post them in the chat section. Uh, I can't see I have gotten any before. Okay, then I'll stop share. Uh, I have a question here is how much work is needed to make this, as, this a reality in Sweden? From technology and market perspective. I would say that the technology is, is there. If you ask the wind turbine manufacturers, they say we can offer this service by frequency control. Uh, most is the cost and how my work is done. Is That's another question. But they, they have the services if you ask for it. You can just buy it. It's a software thing. So no, no extra hardware is needed. The market is made for hydropower, I would say. This fast frequency reserve is, is coming up, and that's that could be made for that's made for wind, and that's good. So I think the wind turbine owners has to a little bit wake up and see what is possible to do here. And I think several of them have are, are acting in that way. So I think there will be quite a lot of change the coming one or two years that wind turbine will start to participate in the frequency control market. Okay, thank you, Ola. I think we, if there's no more questions, I think we can go on to the next speaker. And that would be Olof. And see if you can share your screen. My name is Olof Sommerson. I'm uh, very happy to be here to talk about uh, a recently started project uh, where we suggest that wind power supports our system restoration. Um, so what I will talk about is uh, both here uh, outline a summary. This affects the transmission system uh, operator who is doing uh, a lot of restoration work today, uh, mainly I would say all of it, that uh, they have to look into uh, other uh, options, which is the point with this to, to do something in a new way. Um, for the wind turbines, um, the uh, converter control uh, needs to be adjusted probably and for the system operators owning the network where the wind turbines are uh, are connected they also need to to take on a more uh, active role so these three points i will talk about so restoration means that there has been a blackout um, and there are many different types of or blackout uh, with different geographical uh, extent. So uh, some of us remember uh, the 2003 blackout where you see the gray area here where it was blackout after a, a change in a uh, quick stop in Oscar Sham nuclear unit and uh, a problem with a disconnector here outside um, uh, Ringhaus. Um, we could also follow a, a TV series uh, last year um, uh, where they said that there was a, a solar storm uh, causing a, a national blackout in Sweden. And, and these are on the, uh, on the national level. And we have the, the regional um, or, or more local blackouts uh, that has been in media a lot with Gotland being uh, without power. And uh, also uh, there was, has been uh, problems with Erland. And um, if you read about the Erland blackout here, you know that uh, the, the cause of that was uh, too much wind power. So that looks like a, a challenge in this context here. And then finally, we have the very local blackouts where there is just one uh, single uh, power line being uh, 
damaged typically like falling trees or so like here, uh, typically in connection with, with storms. Uh, so uh, coming back from a blackout can be different and uh, to understand this we have to look out how the power system is organized or operation is organized. So um, minding the uh, operating the national grid is uh, the transmission system operator Svenska Kraftnet in Sweden. Then uh, at the uh, uh, slightly lower voltage level, we have a, a regional network uh, where we have only three operators in Sweden, Eon, Vattenfall, Elevio. They, this is typically called subtransmission. In most other countries, this is the same, same company as, uh, as the, is, is the TSO, but in Sweden, we have a separate solution for that. And then we have the local networks. Um, which is distribution, and this is typically operated by a municipal uh, utility, like uh, here in Lund, or it could be on Vattenfall Elevio um, that uh, manage, for example, rural uh, distribution. And this is very often where, where uh, wind turbines or wind farms are located. So if we look at uh, a, a case like the 2003 blackout uh, and illustrates the traditional uh, strategy for uh, recovering after a, a, such a blackout. This is called top-down restoration. And usually there is a, a, an intact network somewhere we, where we can start, or, or if there is nothing um, in the system, Svenska uh, Kraftnet, they start a unit in the Lule L river. Um, so in this case, uh, we had a blackout below the blackout line here, and you can see the Svenska Kraftnet lines here being energized on the on the northern side and uh, largely uh, de-energized or, or disconnected on the southern side. So what they do then is uh, after uh, half an hour, and in that case, in, this, in September 2003, uh, they energized lines all the way down to Sege outside Malmö and to the nuclear units in Oskarshamn. But as you can see, uh, the, uh, the areas, the customers in these areas, it's still gray. So that means they don't have power because the, the priority is on energizing the transmission lines. So the uh, strategy is to go south uh, line by line, connect uh, energize uh, lines, and then also start and connect power plants until the network is sufficiently uh, strong. At that time, the underlying uh, distribution networks are uh, energized, first the trans sub transmission level and then the distribution level. And um, for example, after an hour here, power is back in, in these areas, and after another hour, power is back in these uh, uh, areas, and then the rest is, um, there is a slide more, no, uh, finally uh, these areas. So it takes some time, and in the distribution level, uh, these uh, areas are energized uh, all at once, uh, if they're small or parts. And this is where customers and typically wind turbines uh, are, are connected. The customers were actually never disconnected and wind turbines, they finally come back when the network uh, is energized. So this is the standard procedure. And uh, as uh, I mentioned briefly, uh, hydropower is uh, the main resource uh, here because they are fast and flexible. And if you look at the geography, it looks like this with hydro in the north. And if you look at where we live in Sweden, it's in the south. Uh, this is where wind uh, power comes in because, uh, as you see, it, we have a lot of wind power in the south. No hydro and actually nowadays uh, less and less uh, nuclear. So maybe locally in the south, uh, wind power is our primary resource. And as you heard from uh, Ola Karlsson, um, uh, wind power is taking on more and more system services uh, that usually is supplied by hydropower. And we believe that this can be done also uh, concerning restoration because the power electronics makes them very capable. So we suggest uh, something looking like uh, the opposite in the extreme case. 
doesn't have to be extreme case. We can think of intermediate solutions, but this would be the opposite. So we start at a number of points and create small system islands. Uh, for example, starting uh, with a wind turbine, energize the nearby local network uh, with customers. This could be farmers. Maybe those owning the wind turbines would be very happy to use them in, turn, in, in case of, of a blackout. And when these uh, small islands uh, are in, uh, growing in size and are strong enough, then we energize the, the overlying lines and finally the transmission, and then we synchronize larger uh, power plants. And then finally, we synchronize these islands to each other and have a complete system. Um, this does affect system operation a lot. So Considering the control center situation at uh, the at Svenskkraftnet, they have a lot of tasks. At Eon, Elevio, Vattenfall, they have uh, some less tasks. And the smaller companies and the local distribution, they have even uh, fewer tasks. And you see the leading restoration, closely following and following restoration. This is uh, required to, to change. Uh, meaning that lower levels need to, to take on um, uh, more tasks and frequency and restoration are important for this. The wind turbines, um, they look like uh, this inside with a lot of hardware, uh, but also some software in the uh, control. And today we have what is called grid following control and looking at the evaluation here that I uh, borrowed from Massimo Bongiorno, the next speaker. We see the black starting capability, which is uh, what I'm talking about, is not possible with this form of control. So we have to go to the other uh, type, which is called uh, grid forming. Um, so this uh, grid forming converter will be used to uh, energize the system. And uh, now starting to energize uh, from uh, a wind turbine, uh, this would mean energizing a small transformer. This means we have inrush currents. So there are a number of questions that we will look at in this project. So uh, what can we energize with a certain converter and what, has, uh, what are the requirements on voltage control following that? And uh, if we are a network operator, we usually build all this uh, on experience and short circuit MVA, but maybe this is not relevant anymore. So we need to find something else. And when we reach consumers, we need active power. It would be nice if we could use the active power from the wind uh, turbine, but uh, this is practically not reliable. So probably we need some battery storage, uh, which is easy to connect uh, if we want. We could use a diesel generator like these ones. Uh, this is a network operator supplied one. This is a, a tractor uh, powered uh, generator. And one question there is how can we make these uh, cooperate? Um, and what are the requirements on frequency control and, and con other control of of all this. Um, so uh, this is more or less what I would like to present. So the project uh, in short, uh, it has uh, an English and uh, a Swedish um, abbreviation like this. It has uh, major support from the Swedish Energy Agency and a substantial one also from Svenska it will be run uh, uh, from this year and to 2023 um, at my uh, division here in Lund University. And key persons are uh, a PhD student, a senior researcher, and uh, myself. So this concludes my presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, Olof. Uh, if you have questions, please put them in, in the chat. Uh, I can start with one question. Uh, you said you will start off with this uh, islanding modes. Uh, should this only be when you have a problem or should they always be running in island mode? Uh, 
Yeah, this depends on what someone uh, wants, uh, but uh, the starting point after the, the, uh, in the restoration phase is uh, uh, island mode. Um, but um, the primary ambition here is to get back to normal interconnect interconnected operation. This uh, project, it does touch a lot on um, uh, microgrids and microgrid operation, and I think your, your question connects to that. And uh, there are microgrids uh, operating today, but what we're after here is operational procedures for network operators. Um, and uh, considering that blackouts usually happen in, uh, or often happen in new places, um, and, and uh, what to do when improvising, or how to say it here. Okay, thank you. More questions for Olaf? Okay, uh, let's see, now we got a couple here first. Will this project look into specific areas like Gotland, which suffers from blackout related to wind and grid stability? It could help with it being a pilot area in Sweden, but can no longer expand wind due to grid stability questions. Uh, so I believe uh, in this project, we have not uh, planned any uh, practical uh, projects. What we did plan was to uh, go to Austria actually and follow their um, regular uh, field tests because they have uh, uh, power electronics connected uh, hydropower and they do um, black start and island operation with these. So this is the closest to actual field tests that uh, we will be doing in the project. Um, we are very open to add-ons or um, initiatives um, when we have something that we believe we can test. Okay, good. Uh, then we have another question, maybe more going back to, to my questions a bit. How flexible can islands be and what is needed technically, technically to synchronize multiple islands? Yeah, this is a very uh, important question because um, there is uh, pretty advanced, let's say the, the uh, wind turbines, they are very capable and, and they are well equipped when it comes to uh, control and uh, uh, of different types. But um, uh, when we think of the uh, local and the distribution networks, they are not well equipped uh, with uh, breakers and synchronizing equipment. So um, I think um, at least an intermediate uh, point in the development will be to continue using the traditional uh, Svenska Kraftnet top-down procedure, but um, to simultaneously start uh, the, uh, the bottom-up uh, procedure. And when the uh, top-down procedure has reached all the way down um, until your island, then you uh, actually de-energize it, black it down temporarily, and you do the, the regular um, startup of that. That is how I see it practically in the first step. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we will not have time for more questions now, but we will be back for the discussion part. So thank you, Olaf. Then we go to next speaker. That would be Massimo Bongiorno from Chalmers. Okay, so nice to be in the right room. <laughs> so good morning, everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, harmonic interaction in uh, offshore wind power plants, but consider that this also applies to all power electronics dominated grids. And uh, the, to start with, I think that what we can consider is how has the power system started? Because when we talk about the power system, we are so used to have electricity at home that we don't think that the power system is a fairly new uh, entity. I mean, the power system is about 100 years old and everything started with um, just providing light into the streets and then to the houses of uh, very rich people. And it was Thomas Edison with his DC system that started, was really the entrepreneur when it comes to these type of things. And uh, 
there was uh, a very popular station, it was the Pearl Street station in the uh, US that was used to supply about 82 customers. And you can see that the voltage level at that time was 110 volts DC. However, as we all know, the main problems related to the DC system, which are basically the difficulty of stepping up the voltage, and then the fact that generators are typically not so effective when it comes to DC as compared with the AC counterpart, then has led to the big development of the AC system like the one that we know today. And uh, this AC system in uh, over these 100 years has developed in an incredible way. And uh, today we can say that the power system is the most complicated object that uh, the human being has built. It's enough just to look on the structure of the European power system. This is just a transmission system, of course, from NSOE. And uh, the reason why the power system has evolved in this way is basically to guarantee higher reliability of the system and more effective use of the uh, power that is generation that is installed in the system. And uh, also to try to smoothen out the load picking that we have over the day and over time. So if we look at the structure of the power system, we know that typically we have a transmission system that is uh, in a meshed configuration. And then we have a medium voltage system that is radial where we typically connect large loads. And then through a step down transformer, we connect households. And then uh, on the system that we have today, we can say that we have a relatively small amount still of renewables connected, mainly wind and solar. So the main question is how should the power system change in order to become fully sustainable, but at the same time reliable and always available? And this is a real challenge because if we look at the um, uh, expected penetration level of renewables by 2026, this is a forecast that has been published recently by NSOE, then you can see that many countries are expected in only 15 year, 25 years to go fully renewables. Among these, you can identify Denmark, for example, or Great Britain. And many other countries will have um, a, a power uh, demand from renewables that exceeds the 50%. Please observe that here they consider mainly only solar and wind and small hydro. That is why, for example, Norway looks so small. It's not considered into this statistic. So for this reason, and so he has identified a number of challenges that are uh, uh, related to these power electronic dominated grids with a lot of renewables. One is what we also heard during the discussion today in the plenary session that is related to the reduced amount of inertia, meaning that if there is a fast transient, a large transient in the system, then the frequency will drop more with a higher slope. And here you can see that in a scenario from NSOE, by 2030, it is expected that many countries of the European Union will have an inertia time constant that is less than two seconds. So this is really an alarming point. Also, it is expected that the short circuit power will go down. And this means that the, the grid will become weaker, uh, weaker and weaker. And as a result, we expect that if there is a fault in the grid, then the voltage will reduce over a wider uh, area as compared with what happens today. Related still to the inertia, then we expect a reduced stability margin in the system, meaning that the system can be more volatile and large events can lead to loss of synchronism for the generators that are connected. And finally, control interaction. Control interaction is basically that more converters that are connected to the grid might start to interact in an unplanned way. And this is what we are going to focus on now. So what is a control interaction and why it is a problem? Basically, if you have a number of controllable objects that are connected to the grid, then we can experience unwanted resonance phenomena between the converter and the grid or 
the converter and another converter is connected to the grid. So what is important to do is to understand if a single object, let's say this converter, can negatively impact the stability of the rest of the system. In order to do that, there are, of course, a lot of different approaches that can be taken. What we used in this project is to look at the converter from the PCC point of view and see if this converter in the frequency range behaves like a positive resistance. Why that? Because if this converter for all frequencies act as a positive resistance, then we know that if there is a resonance on this side, then this converter will not destabilize the resonance. We are not saying that the system will not become unstable or we are not saying that the system will positively contribute to damp any kind of oscillation. But if there is an instability, it's not a fault of the converter under investigation. So how do we do that? I will not go into the details of the equation, but simply we look at the power that we have uh, into the converter. So if you look at the active power into the converter, then if at all frequencies this power is positive, then we know that the converter is absorbing active power, so it's acting as a resistor. Then we are happy. In order to do that, we take some indices that we indicate as lambda here. If you want more information about this, please contact me, or you can look also at the reports that have been published on the Energy Minihedon website for these projects. So let's take an example now. We take a converter, a generic grid following converter, like this can be typically a wind turbine. Actually, this is the control of a type four wind turbine. And then what we do is to change the speed of the synchronization algorithm for this wind turbine. And we look at these indices here. So what you can see is that the larger is the speed of response of this synchronization algorithm from green to blue to red, the more the negative region is, which means that if we have resonances in this area, then there is a risk for instability. We cannot say if there is an instability or not, but there is a risk for instability. In order to understand if there will be real instability, then we must have also a model of the connecting grid. So this is the grid that we have been looking in, into this uh, uh, system, just to say that all this work has been carried out in cooperation with my colleague Meb Tubeza which was actually the one that really did the, did the job. So what we did was to look at uh, the, um, a wind farm located in the Nordic Sea. In the beginning, we focused mainly on Borwin, then we also focused on Lillgrund. And uh, in this case, as you most surely know, the wind turbines are connected into radials and then through an HVDC, power is sent back to shore. So this is the model of the wind turbine, the wind farm. And as you can understand, it is basically impossible to uh, really um, uh, model analytically such a big system. So the first thing that we did was to look at model aggregation. So as in terms of model aggregation, then here we have found out that this was the optimal way for our studies to aggregate the model. So basically we take the entire radial here, as you can see, up to the point where the HVDC is connected to the energy hub. And here you can see a comparison of the, those quantities that I showed before, the input admittance of the converter, for the case where you have the aggregate, the blue, and we have the detailed model of the red in the frequency range. And you can clearly see that the two systems perfectly overlap. Here we have assumed that the turbines are operated close to a similar operating condition, not to difference, about 20% different, and that the control structure is similar, not exactly equal, but similar. If you want to see more results about this, you can find it in the report or you can contact me. So if we go back to the original value, the original scheme, you see that, as we said, we have a risk for interaction in frequency ranges that are very low, depending on the speed of synchronization of the algorithm. 
And then we have made an example where uh, we take now a connecting grid that has some uh, characteristic resonance. And you can see that some of these resonances, depending on the characteristic of the grid, will fall into the region where the converter has a negative input admittance. And as expected from the theoretical result, this clearly denotes that there is an instability in the system. So the model works very nicely and can really predict the instability. The question then is, how can we dump them? Well, obviously, the way to dump this type of oscillation is to have good knowledge of the connecting grid and good knowledge of uh, those frequencies where the converter can be destabilized or can destabilize the system. In order to do that, then we have to remember that the converter has a difference compared with the more traditional resonances, for instance, from synchronous generator or from passive elements, does not have an own resonant frequency, but everything is dependent on the type of filters that are installed and especially on the control strategies adopted. So in this case, what we really need is more transparency when it comes to uh, knowledge of the speed of response of the converters or eventually to set up requirements that indicate in which frequencies the converters have to be passive. And these are requirements that are not too far to be implemented in the power systems, as we can clearly see that they are already applied in other systems like railway, et cetera. So what to keep it really in an eye on, mainly is the low frequency range. So it's the outer loops of the controller. Those are the ones that can really put in troubles the system and where we really need the requirements today. For the higher frequency range, where we can still experience oscillations, they can, this can be more easily dumped with uh, filters since we are moving into the high frequency range. And anyway, these are mainly due to delays, etc. So it's a hardware problem that is much more difficult to solve. Okay, I think that I am done with my time. So I will stop here and uh, I will be happy to answer questions if you have any. Oops. Thank you, Massimo. Yes, please, if you have questions for Massimo, uh, write them in the chat, please.